Hi there, my name is Matt Thompson. I'm the Aquaculture Project Lead at the Anderson Cabot Centre for Ocean Life at the New England Aquarium. I'm here continuing our National Seafood Month uh, series of science talks, and I'm focusing on aquaculture. So what is aquaculture? Well, aquaculture is just the farming of aquatic organisms. These can be fin fish, these can be shellfish, things like mussels and clams. These can be even things like seaweeds and uh, uh, crustaceans, things like shrimp, even crabs, lobsters, things as uh, bizarre as octopus and eel have also been farmed in aquaculture. So aquaculture supplies over half of all fin fish that are eaten for food uh, in the world today. And it's really important because aquaculture is the future of seafood. When we look at wild fisheries on a global level, about 60% of those are at the maximum capacity, so they can't be fished anymore. 30, 34% is uh, overfished, meaning that we really need to sort of tone that back and fish less, and only a tiny proportion can actually stand uh, an increase in fishing pressure. So that means as our population increases, the only way that we're gonna feed people more seafood is by farming it, by virtue of aquaculture. So what does aquaculture look like? Well, with over 600 aquatic organisms being farmed globally, uh, there's quite a diversity in uh, how uh, these animals are raised. So some common production systems or farm designs include things like net pens. Net pens are open systems. They're essentially floating nets in, the, in a large body of water, be it the marine environment or freshwater environment like lakes. Uh, the fish are kept inside that net but it's an open system, so water can freely move in and out, wastes are uh, deposited into the environment. Common um, species used with net pens include Atlantic salmon and bluefin tuna. Ponds are another uh, really important aquaculture system, and again, these can be um, coastal or these can be freshwater systems. Uh, all farm shrimp in, in the market today is raised on a pond system. Um, tanks and raceways are common systems for uh, fin fish as well. Um, raceway systems are basically like very long, stretched out tanks, um, and they usually have, they're usually gravity fed, so water flows from a high end to a low end. Another use of um, tank systems is a recirculating aquaculture system. So then in this case, uh, water is not released into the environment. It goes through a series of filters uh, until it's clean enough to be used again and again and again in that system. Uh, when we talk about shellfish systems, there are, there are two different types. There are are suspension systems. Uh, these are systems that keep the, uh, the uh, aquatic organism off the bottom and often the reason for that is to avoid predators or to keep the animal in, a, in an optimum condition to grow as fast as possible. So some suspension systems would be rafts where you have the, the raft on the surface and production lines that uh, hang down in the water column or a long line which is basically like an underwater clothesline uh, where you're uh, attaching production lines to that, uh, to that submersed um, clothesline system for them to grow. Things like uh, mussels are commonly farmed on this and they attach themselves directly to those production lines. Seaweeds is another one using suspension system. And sometimes you'd use uh, nets, you'd attach nets to those systems too. And then you can farm things like scallops. Uh, we also farm on the bottom directly, either on little uh, trestles where you can keep bags of oysters and protect them from predators, uh, in some cases, you just distribute uh, farmed uh, oysters onto the seabed itself and let them grow. And in some cases, you use that bag system again and you bury it into the seabed. Um, things like clams are farmed that way and that protects uh, the clams from predators. So these are very common production systems that we find uh, applied all over the world in different, different ways. Well, it's actually critical to the US seafood market. If we look at the top 10 seafood items uh, in the US, and we're each eating about 16 pounds on average of uh, seafood a year, shrimp is the number one seafood item. It accounts for over a quarter of the seafood we're eating, and 90% of uh, that shrimp market is supplied by uh, pond systems, aquaculture systems in places like uh, Indonesia and India. If we look at number two, salmon, 70% of that market is supplied by aquaculture. And in fact, it doesn't matter where you go, be it a restaurant or a supermarket, all of the Atlantic salmon that you see comes from aquaculture. And it's commonly farmed in net pens in places like uh, Norway or Chile. At number four, we have tilapia. 
uh, all of that probably is farm raised and it's um, from places like China and again this could be in pond systems or cage systems uh, Indonesia is another major contributor to that market and number six we have uh, Pangasius pretty much all raised in uh, pond systems in Vietnam and at number eight we finally see a, a strong American influence so this is catfish and a significant portion of that is raised in uh, freshwater ponds here in America. At number 10, we have clams. So pretty much uh, no matter where we are in America, um, farm-raised seafood is there. There's no single definition of environmentally responsible aquaculture. Environmentally responsible aquaculture should limit its impact on the local environment, it should use uh, global resources, particularly uh, limited resources, responsibly. Um, and it should, uh, in its actions, ensure that uh, there's a future of aquaculture. So it's protecting its own production system. So when we're looking at um, species, some of the things we might think about are, is that a native or a non-native organism? So a uh, non-native organism, you know, you might be worried about uh, it escaping from that farm. And if it does so, what kind of impact does it have on the uh, environment? If it's a uh, native species, you know, sometimes these can be caught from the wild and they uh, have very little impact if they escape. Uh, but in other cases, um, even uh, native organisms can go through a process of selective breeding. So if it does escape, even if it's native, uh, interbreeding with wild populations can be a, a negative issue. Another thing you might look at is feed. So um, finfish used in aquaculture commonly uh, would use um, a, a, a amount of protein in their feed. And sometimes that protein does come from other marine organisms. Fish that are specifically caught in order to be uh, cooked down into protein powders and marine oils. So some of the questions you might have is, well, how much of this marine resource is being used to feed that animal? Um, and also what were the health of those uh, fisheries that were used to uh, to provide that protein and oil. So the next part of that equation is the production system. So on the other side, it's like, how well um, does this farm or the actions, what actions does this farm do to prevent disease, which we call biosecurity? Are they utilizing things like vaccines to uh, prevent disease outbreaks on their farm? Are they preventing the influx of water and treating it to uh, prevent diseases being brought onto the farm and then passing through the, uh, to the, the farm population? Um, another question you might have is the habitat. You know, when the farm was built, did it uh, result in the conversion of uh, ecologically important um, systems like uh, mangrove forests, which thankfully is a significant thing in the past for shrimp farming, um, but also coral reefs and other uh, production systems or environmental systems might be impacted in a farm. Another question is how well does that farm deal with uh, pollution, waste created on that? Does the, uh, does the farm filter out that waste? Does it release it into an environment where they can understand uh, the tolerances so that it can absorb those wastes without creating uh, a further ecological impact further downstream? And another thing that's really important to us is uh, how does it interact with wildlife? These can be things like predators that are uh, out in the wild and see um, the, uh, the farmed animals a tasty treat. You know, do they try to attack that farm and create holes that those animals can escape? And the other thing is um, passive engagement with, uh, with wildlife, things where they, the wildlife's not trying to attack the farm. Uh, this is really important for things like whales or sea turtles that might become entangled in some of the, the lines and ropes that are used in a farm system if it's not appropriately sighted or it's not designed in a way to minimize those interactions. So it's a combination of all these factors that goes into this uh, decision-making process of how uh, environmentally responsible a uh, farm is. And of course, sometimes the, uh, the improvements, the solutions need to be on a farm specific basis. Maybe it's change one particular action or activity on the farm. In other cases, it might be on a global level, um, that there are species that are commonly farmed but have a common problem. And maybe we don't quite know what those solutions are uh, at this time. Uh, so sometimes it, it is a little bit of a, a trade-off. It's this combination of these two factors and how they play together. Uh, and the vast diversity of agriculture that keeps this job uh, interesting. Well, I, I hope I piqued your interest about environmentally responsible agriculture. Um, if you do have questions, please post them. We'll do our best to answer them. And uh, follow the aquarium social media feeds for more ways that you can get involved in sustainable seafood and other ways to protect the blue planet. Thank you.